Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's Friday, so it's time for a gross path challenge. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures and these challenges, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me so many great images, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these little quizzes together. Let's go ahead and get out our pencils and papers. Take about 90 seconds per question. While you're writing your answer down, shut down the playback and turn it back on when you're ready to hear the answer. Okay, question number one is going to be tissue from a cat. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, we have three sections of the brain of this cat. One from the telencephalon or forebrain. One from probably the diencephalon in the area of the midbrain. And then we have a sagittal section through the cerebellum and the fourth ventricle. First thing that you'll notice on this is that the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle are markedly dilated, especially these lateral ventricles. And so we likely have something that is occluding the drainage of cerebrospinal fluid from the brain. And this most often happens in small animals at the smallest, most constricted area, which is the mesencephalic aqueduct, which drains the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. Generally, we are looking at either an inflammatory process or a mass lesion. And when we think about cats, the most common cause of this is acquired due to feline infectious peritonitis, especially the dry form, which affects the nervous system. And you can get severe inflammation in the area of the mesencephalic aqueduct and occlusion and massive dilation of everything upstream. The morphologic diagnosis for feline infectious peritonitis in the brain would be a pyogranulomatous ventriculitis and periventriculitis with marked internal hydrocephalus. If you were to take a section right here at the edges of the ventricle, you would see marked pyogranulomatous inflammation, which is centered on vessels. And there's always a lot of periventricular inflammation as well. The cause of feline infectious peritonitis is uh, a mutated feline coronavirus. All cats have feline coronavirus. Um, it's a normal finding in the intestine of the cat, but in a very few cats, this virus has the ability um, to survive within macrophages as a result of a mutation. And then the body cannot clear it and the animals develop uh, feline infectious peritonitis. Okay. Great slide. Let's go on to slide number two. And this is tissue from a rhesus macaque. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and an associated lesion. Okay, time's up. We're looking at the intestine of the macaque and it has sort of a waxy appearance with blunted villi. And this is what we see in association with intestinal amyloidosis. So diffuse intestinal amyloidosis would be the morphologic diagnosis. And it's not uncommon for macaques to get intestinal amyloidosis and suffer from severe diarrhea. Um, secondary to a number of inflammatory lesions one that was published in VetPath back in the 90s um, was osteoarthritis. And this was a number of rhesus macaques who were housed in cages for their entire life where they didn't even have the opportunity to stand up. And they had severe osteoarthritis throughout their body and eventually um, all succumbed to severe diarrhea as a result of intestinal amyloidosis. You can see it in other organs as well. Um, kidney would be one that would be commonly affected. 
This is also commonly seen in animal, animals that have implants uh, in laboratory settings such as skull caps or other monitoring devices for a long time and a low-grade inflammation eventually results in amyloidosis in multiple organs. I forgot to mention the liver, which is another very common site. Okay, decimal amyloidosis um, due to chronic inflammation. Shall we move on? I think so. Slide number three is a goodie from the collection of John King. And this is from a cat. And I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and name another affected organ. Okay, we're looking at the liver of this cat, and we see multifocal to coalescing areas of either necrosis or separative inflammation, or maybe a little of both. They are variably sized, so some are a little more recently developed than others. Others are more long-standing, and they will be larger. If you said multifocal to coalescing hepatic necrosis or necrotizing hepatitis, full credit. If you said multifocal coalescing suppurative hepatitis, I'm going to give you full credit too. And this is the classic picture of gram-negative sepsis, especially hot toxin-producing gram-negatives. And when I think about the really hot gram-negatives, the one that I'm going to think of first is the cause of this lesion, and that's Francisella tularensis. Now, all hot gram-negatives, we're, we're talking about Francisella, we're talking about Yersinia, maybe we're talking about Salmonella. Uh, all of them have a fairly stereotypical pathogenesis. These hot gram negatives come into the body and the first thing that they go after is lymphoid tissue. They're ingested and the largest concentration of lymphoid tissue is gonna be in the ileum. So that is often where it is hit first. You will concurrently see necrosis within the ileal lymphoid tissue, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and the spleen. Now, it always starts in the ileum. It gets into the bloodstream and lymphatics as it erodes its way through the mucosa. And that's how it ends up in the liver. The liver doesn't ha really have anything of interest to these hot gram negatives, but it gets into the portal system by eroding through the wall of the intestine into the blood supply, and it shoots straight up to the liver, and it's just as happy to cause necrosis there. But it really likes mesenteric lymph nodes splenic lymphoid tissue, and the lymphoid tissue of the ileum. So either of those would be another affected organ, spleen or mesenteric lymph node. Okay, moving on, slide number four is tissue from a dog. I would like a morphologic diagnosis. Okay, time's up. We see a large black mass within the globe attached to the iris. And this is an anterior uveal melanoma. If you gave yourself ocular melanoma, I'm going to give you half credit. Anterior uveal melanomas are important because they are the most common site of melanoma in the dog. It is one that... Uh, it uh, doesn't metastasize all that much. Um, these are really probably, the vast majority of them are melanocytomas. Uh, they have two cell populations. The predominant one is usually large balloon cells, which are probably melanomacrophages. And there is usually a spindle, uh, a spindle portion, which is the actual neoplastic version. As we said before, these are not the ones that metastasize. They tend to get larger. They may result in a number of changes within the eye, but uh, rarely metastasize. Location is very important for uh, melanomas and melanocytomas in the eye. And when we think about the one that's going to metastasize most, 
both in the dog and the cat. Those are the ones that are located on the conjunctiva, especially close to the sclera. So, anterior uveal melanocytoma in the dog. One other thing that I thought about as I looked at this particular uh, slide is I was wondering if it might be a Cairn Terrier. And so my other rule out for that would be ocular melanosis, a very common problem in Cairn Terriers. And you can see it also in other breeds such as Labrador Retrievers, which have extensive pigmentation around the eye in, to the point where many of these Cairn Terriers will develop glaucoma. But, you know, the vast majority of, of, uh, uh, of these cases I would simply look at and say, anterior uveal melanocytoma. Okay, slide number five is a fantastic picture from Dr. Paul Stromberg. And this is tissue from a turkey. What I'd like for you to give me is the morphologic diagnosis and the pathogenesis of this lesion. Okay, time's up. We're looking at the breast muscle. Here's the keel bone right here. And there is a large area of pectoral muscle necrosis. So the morphologic diagnosis will be focally extensive pectoral muscle necrosis. There is a rim of hemorrhage around it. So if you call this an infarct, I'll give you full credit as well. Infarction of the pectoral muscle. And when you get necrosis, especially in poultry, it often has a greenish discoloration to it. So the pathogenesis of this lesion is you start out with a heavily muscled bird, whether it's a chicken or a turkey. Of course, we want our really, really big turkeys at Thanksgiving. So we have bred these gigantic birds, which may cause an injury like this simply by flapping their wings too much. Okay, so these animals get exercised, they flap their wings, and they do damage to the muscle fiber. And you get swelling of these degenerate or necrotic muscle fibers within the fascia. And you develop this large amount of pressure within the uh, fascia, which is known, at least in people, as compartmental syndrome. And then this contributes to the damage to the myofibers, the difficulty in getting blood into these damaged myofibers, and it's sort of a vicious cycle of increased pressure, ischemia, and necrosis. The name of this condition in birds is deep pectoral myopathy because it's most often seen in the pectoral muscles, and it sort of parallels a uh, similar syndrome that you can see in people who overexert themselves on long hikes, especially uh, young military recruits, um, which is called March gangrene. But in birds, it's deep pectoral myopathy. Okay. Slide number six is tissue from a rat. I like a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and name another affected organ. Okay, time's up. We are looking at the thoracic viscera of a rat. You can see the heart here. One lung does not look particularly involved. And then we have another lung here where the bronchi are markedly dilated and filled with pus. So this morphologic diagnosis, to get it all into the morphologic diagnosis, I need a focally extensive suppurative bronchopneumonia with bronchiectasis. And that's key. If you said suppurative bronchopneumonia because it looks suppurative, it is in the front craniovental aspects of the lung, I'm going to give you half credit because I'm being generous. What I absolutely need to have on this is bronchiectasis. And this other 
lung may look and it looks sort of involved too so it might be a bilateral lesion okay but bronchiectasis is key because this condition is caused by mycoplasma pulmonis uh, mycoplasma across uh, various species when it affects the lung whether it is a dog or a cat or a pig or a mouse or rat um, often has a very standard pathogenesis um, mycoplasma are cell wall deficient bacteria that want nothing more out of life than to become a cilium it's not much to aspire to but that's their dream and so you'll always find them nestled among the cilia in various organs that have that I did ask you for another organ uh, reproductive tract you'll find cilia there so you can find it in the uterus um, and also the the uh, tympanic bulla okay so those are other areas are commonly affected by mycoplasma pulmonis. Other mycoplasma, um, especially in production animals, will affect the joints. Uh, I'm not familiar with that being a significant problem in affected laboratory rodents. So let's get back to the story of mycoplasma. Uh, mycoplasma is a very uh, stereotypical approach to the lung. When it gets into the lung, it causes uh, damage to the cilia, ciliostasis, impairment of the uh, mucociliary escalator, and then there is a massive influx of neutrophils. The neutrophils, when they get in there, they get together, they have a party, they explode, they release their digestive enzymes, causing further damage to the affected bronchiole or bronchus and it dissolves the elastin in the wall and they become essentially these big bags of pus that no matter how long this animal lives they will never be able to get rid of these dilated bronchi full of pus the final step in the transformation by mycoplasma is the elaboration of mycoplasmal superantigens which cause massive uh, increase in the amount of bronchiolar associated lymphoid tissue so you end up with these large pus filled uh, airways that are surrounded by large numbers of lymphocytes pretty standard approach for mycoplasma and in the rat mycoplasma pulmonis is a uh, we don't see it much anymore unless you get your your uh, laboratory rats from uh, the pet store but if you ever want to see it a pet store rat or mouse will probably give you a very good sampling. Okay. Slide number seven is tissue from a goat. I would like to have a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. You'll probably only see this lesion grossly in goats. Um, certainly a large number of other animal species are susceptible to it, but uh, goats are the ones that give you the gross lesions. They're usually imperceptible in cattle and horses. Well, you can see that we're looking at a sagittal section of the cerebellum and the brainstem, and there's a focal area of hemorrhage in the brainstem. And remember, whenever we see hemorrhage, we're gonna think about necrosis, they always go hand in hand with very rare exceptions. So this would be multifocal to coalescing, necrohemorrhagic rhombencephalitis. That's a nice term for inflammation of the brainstem, rhombencephalitis. Now, if you know what we're looking at, I might actually call it a suppurative encephalitis of the brainstem. There aren't a lot of things that attack the brainstem and cause hemorrhage. In the dog, you can see it with canine adenovirus type one, but you're very limited in other species. And this is a classic lesion that's associated with Listeria monocytogenes infection. Um, because I can't think of very many other things that cause that. And I know that one of the uh, the hallmark lesions associated with listeria infection in the brainstem 
is the formation of microabscesses. I would give full credit for suppurative encephalitis as well. There is a lot of necrosis. So if you said necrotizing or suppurative, I'm going to give you full credit. Uh, Listeria monocytogenes is usually seen in ruminants. Uh, in cattle, it is seen as a result of eating spoiled silage. If the acidity of the silage doesn't quite get it as low as it should, it allows for the growth of listeria. Listeria is a very hardy bacteria that can also uh, grow in a wide range of foodstuffs um, and can also survive it in temperatures associated with refrigeration. So you can see listeria outbreaks as a result of eating ice cream. Um, so not, of course, the ruminants aren't, the people are getting that. We're right now undergoing a one of the largest outbreaks of listeria ever documented in South Africa associated with sausage. So you can get it in a wide range of foodstuffs. And uh, in cattle, it's almost always associated with silage. Goats, it's not associated with silage. So, uh, but you can see it in horses. You can see it in a wide range of, uh, of different animal species. Um, the, the encephalitis is one of the various manifestations of listeria. You can also see septicemia and listeria causing necrosis in multiple organs. And then finally, it can also be a cause of abortion. That is a result of septicemia, and then the fetus becomes septicemic as well, but the placenta becomes necrotic. The animal was, it will be aborted, uh, usually in late gestation. So, great picture. Not a lot of things are going to cause hemorrhage within the brainstem. Slide number eight is from a pig. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and three possible causes. Okay, time's up. It's a classic lesion. Morphologic diagnosis is <clears throat> diffuse fibrinous pleuritis. Now, I'm very happy if you said fibrinous pleur pneumonia. Chances are we are dealing with that as well. It looks like there's some rib impressions. But if you said Fibrinous pleuritis, I'm going to take that. Three possible causes, well, three classic causes of fibrinous polycerocytis in swine are strepsuis, mycoplasma hyorhinus, and haemophilus parasuis. You may hear this disease referred to as Glasser's disease in swine. Um, and Dr. Glasser actually worked with Haemophilus. He didn't work with the other two agents, but he worked with Haemophilus parasuis. And uh, this is one of the manifestations of systemic sepsis associated with these three agents. There is a profound outpouring of fibrin into potential spaces within the body. So you would see uh, fibrin here uh, in the pleura, in the abdomen, in the meninges, and also in the joints. Whenever I see so much fibrin in any animal species, I want to think of strep, but in swine, you also need to think about uh, mycoplasma and haemophilus parasuis as well. Slide number nine is from a cat, and I would simply like a morphologic diagnosis. Okay, time is up. This is a Persian cat. This is a lesion that's often seen in Persian cats or other flat-faced breeds. It's usually seen in the central cornea. Um, these flat-faced cats, their eyes bulge a little bit. Um, they often cannot totally close their eyelids um, over this area, so it is a little more prone to this particular lesion. And we have a large area of corneal mummification. Okay, it's also known as a sequestrum. So if you said corneal sequestrum or corneal mummification, I'm giving you full credit. And histologically, this is just an area of dried out cornea. And it looks brownish black. And eventually, if left to its own devices, um, it will, there will be re-epithelialization underneath the uh, corneal sequestrum and it will fall off. There probably will be uh, a scar there, but uh, and the cause of this 
maybe focal corneal drying in the center of the cornea, which is usually where it's seen. You can see that there is some neovascularization, so this is a fairly long-standing lesion, but something that's most often seen in Persian cats. Okay, histologically, nothing except a little brownish discoloration of a fairly normal-looking cornea. So, corneal sequestrum or corneal mummification. Here's our last slide for today. Slide number 10 is from a chicken. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and name the condition? Okay, time is up. This is multifocal, hyperkeratotic and proliferative dermatitis. If you wanna be totally complete, then you would say hyperkeratotic and proliferative dermatitis of the comb and wattles. Now, you might not have ever thought about this particular condition in chickens, but if you see hyperkeratotic dermatitis in just about any other species, uh, you, are go you are going to think about dermatophytosis, and chickens get dermatophytosis as well. The disease name in chickens is Favus, F-A-V-U-S, very similar to uh, what we see in other species with dermatophytosis. So that's a good one for you. Um, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. We won't have a uh, gross path challenge next week because I will be at the beach. I won't have, uh, have the bandwidth to uh, put one up. But, We'll continue again in two weeks. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.